Paramount Pictures faces copyright lawsuit over Top Gun. Top Gun hit by copyright suit claims Paramount. Top Gun in breach of copyright, according to O. Oh, seems like Paramount's legal department has gone. Maverick. So this lawsuit was filed by Shosh Yone and Yuval Yone in the United States District Court for the Central District of California, seeking declaratory relief and injunctive relief while making a claim for copyright infringement. This is involving a very interesting and recent copyright policy or copyright law that was created with the 1976 Copyright Act. The notion of termination that writers and other artists could license their works for others to create derivative content from, but then those writers and other artists can terminate that assignment of copyright 35 years after the publication of the work. This was intended to allow these creators to renegotiate their licenses after the 35 years if the value of the original work was not apparent at the time of creation. This protection only applies to works made after the 1978 Copyright Act and does not apply to works made for hire. So if the Yonais wrote the original Top Gun story, licensed that for the original Top Gun movie, and then terminated the assignment of those rights at the 35-year statutory period properly. If they did all that properly, then they own the rights in the original. And what we really need to find out then is exactly when was Top Gun Maverick the derivative of the original that was authorized at the time? Was that finished in time? or? Was it not finished in time and therefore is not an authorized derivative work? And the Yonais do have a claim for copyright infringement. The rest is spelled out pretty well in the complaint. Let's take a look at what they have to say. Ehud Yonais is the author of the original 1983 story entitled Top Guns, from which the 1986 motion picture Top Gun and the recently released 2022 sequel motion picture Top Gun Maverick are derived. The iconic 1986 film all started with Paramount securing exclusive motion picture rights to Ehud Yonais' copyrighted story immediately after its publication. In fact, the author's story was duly credited on the derivative 1986 film, which is widely known to have been based on the story. So they're starting with a foundation that the Top Gun movies are derivative works of Ehud Yonais' 1983 story or book. On January 23rd, 2018, the Yonais properly availed themselves of their right to recover the copyright to the story under the Copyright Act, 17 U.S.C. Section 203A, by sending Paramount a statutory notice of termination and thereafter filing it with the Copyright Office effective January 24th, 2020. So 17 U.S.C. 203 is the section for the termination of copyrights, termination of transfers and licenses granted by the author. And so 203A is the conditions for termination. It cannot be a work made for hire, so it must be something where you licensed the work directly and you weren't hired to make the work for someone else. You can't terminate a work made for hire. But once you meet the conditions, all rights under this title that were covered by the terminated grants revert to the author. A derivative work prepared under authority of the grant before its termination may continue to be utilized under the terms of its grant after its termination, but this privilege does not extend to the preparation after the termination of other derivative works. So critical to the Yonais case is when did this derivative work, uh, when was it completed? Because if the work was prepared under the authority of the grant before termination, what date is that? When is a movie finished? If it's 99.9% if it's finished, but they have to put like one pixel of finishing touches on it, and that pixel makes it take the next day, and the next day means the termination is effective, what, what happens there? That's, that's what I'm curious about. On January 24th, 2020, the copyright to the story thus reverted to the Yonais under the Copyright Act, but... Paramount deliberately ignored this, thumbing its nose at the statute. This case arises out of Paramount's conscious failure to reacquire the requisite film and ancillary rights to the Yonais copyrighted story 
prior to the completion and release of their derivative 2022 sequel. And let me speculate here for a moment. I'm going to guess that the Yonez wanted a significant chunk of money because it's a very popular story. The song is popular. The Danger Zone song is popular. The movie is popular. Tom Cruise got popular. Aviator Sunglasses got popular. It was a really, really, really uh, popular 1980s movie. So the Yonez probably want their cut, and they they deserve it. I'm sure that there's a, a number that they deserve, and Paramount might think that that number's different. Who knows? I'm just speculating there. Paramount engaged in the willful conduct alleged herein, so they're setting the stage for willful statutory damages or willfulness multipliers, notwithstanding that it is a sophisticated multinational corporation whose core business is based upon the value and enforcement of copyrights, and other intellectual property. So kind of thumbing their nose at, hey, Paramount, you benefit from copyrights. You you shouldn't be guilty of copyright infringement. So plaintiff Shosh Yone is the widow and heir of the author. Uval Yone is the son and heir of the author. And Paramount is a Delaware corporation located in Los Angeles, California. The Copyright Act provides an author with the inalienable right to recapture a copyright to the author's creative material after a lengthy waiting period by statutorily terminating, without cause, prior transfers of such copyright. Termination is carried out by simply serving an advance notice of termination on the original grantee or its successors and filing the notice with the U.S. Copyright Office within delineated time windows. Section 203A provides for the termination of post-1977 transfers of rights under copyright by the author during a five-year period, a five-year window, commencing 35 years after the date the rights were transferred. The requisite notice of termination sets forth the effective date of termination within the five-year termination window when the previously transferred rights under the copyright will be recaptured by the author. Notice of termination may be served by the author at any time between 10 and 2 years before the effective termination date. Works for hire are exempted. The termination right is the most important authorial right provided by the Copyright Act short of copyright itself. Congress was therefore very protective of the termination right and, to that end, enacted a number of provisions to prevent any waiver or encumbrance of the termination interest. In other words, you can't contract around the termination interest. You can't say, I'm going to assign this copyright to you, and I'm also going to agree not to terminate it in 35 years. You can't say that. Uh, this is also a similar situation to what happened in Poland with CD Projekt Red and the author of the Witcher series who clawed back some rights and then demanded uh, uh, additional licensing fees, and I believe they reached a settlement in that one. Congress anticipated that an author's exercise of a termination right would result in a new license by the author to the terminated grantee, so in this case Paramount. The Yonez would terminate the license, Paramount would then renegotiate a license, uh, amount of money would be exchanged, and terms and contract would be signed and everything, and then everyone would go about their business and making money and everything like that. So that's what this is about, is recapturing some of the value that's lost when an author licenses a property, and then that property gains significant value later that wasn't originally anticipated. To that end, Congress provided the original grantee with the exclusive opportunity to relicense an author's recaptured copyright after the notice or termination has been served, but before the effective date of the termination. The termination provisions thus reflect a deliberate balancing of competing interests. Uh, so if that's true, because as a copyright attorney, I have dealt with this termination right precisely zero times in practical practice. So if the original grantee gets an exclusive opportunity to relicense, that's like a right of first refusal. And they have that right after the notice has been served, but before the effective date of termination, because once you reach the effective date of termination, then the original property is available to be relicensed to others, however the original author or owner sees fit. So technically, the underlying story, Top Guns, is available to be relicensed as of... January 24th, 2020, whatever that date was. Under the termination provisions, prior derivative works can continue to be distributed just as before, as we saw. 
Thus, the Yone's recovery of the copyright to the story does not prevent Paramount or its licensees from continuing to exploit prior derivative works, including the 1986 film. It just requires a new license for sequel films or other derivative works completed after the January 24th, 2020 termination date. In addition, because the Copyright Act has no extraterritorial application, foreign rights to the story remain with Paramount such that, notwithstanding the Yone's termination notice, Paramount would always continue to benefit from Top Gun. After the termination date, a new U.S. license from the Yonais to Paramount of the underlying story would simply enable them to fairly participate with others in the proven market value and financial rewards of the author's creation, just as Congress intended. Then they go into some details here, the chain of title. A Hood Yonais story was originally published April 21st, 1983 in the May 1983 issue of California Magazine and was registered with the U.S. Copyright Office October 3rd, 1983. The magazine was not well known and the subject of the story, a naval training base, was rather dry. In contrast, however, the author's copyrighted story was written in a remarkably vivid and cinematic fashion, with references to Hollywood stars and epic films such as From Here to Eternity. Rather than focusing merely on the dry historical details of the training school, the story focuses on the pilots, the top guns, and their personal experiences, singling out two in particular, a hotshot pilot named Yogi and his radio intercept officer, Possum, as they are hammered into a team. It skillfully selects accounts of the pilots' personal lives and precise details of their hops or flight maneuvers to construct a romanticized first-hand experience of what it is like to be a member of an elite Navy fighter squadron. Indeed, the literary and cinematic way the story humanized and energized its subject was so compelling that Paramount immediately sought to lock up exclusive film rights from its author. The resulting films, which faithfully translate this vision and narrative to the screen, have given audiences worldwide a close-up look at the lives of U.S. Navy fighter pilots as curated by a Hood Yonais compelling story. Within weeks of the story's publication, Paramount secured from a Hood Yonais an exclusive assignment of rights dated May 18, 1983, of motion picture and allied rights in this story. There is no doubt that the copyrighted story was the clear genesis of Paramount's 1986 mega-hit film Top Gun. But for the author's literary efforts and evocative prose and narrative, Paramount's beloved film franchise would not exist. On January 23, 2018, the Yonais properly availed themselves of their termination rights under the Copyright Act by sending Paramount a statutory notice of termination, terminating the grant of the author's rights under U.S. copyright in the story, effective January 24, 2020. The termination notice recorded with the U.S. Copyright Office on January 29, 2018, fully complied with Section 203A of the Copyright Act and the regulations promulgated thereunder by the Register of Copyrights. Therefore, as of January 24th, 2020, the Yonais are the sole owners of the U.S. copyright in the story. Now they're going to connect the story to the 2022 sequel movie. Ehud Yonais' story told the story of the Navy Fighter Weapons School training program as personified through the eyes of Yogi and Possum. In the story, the author brought to life what could have easily been a barren subject of facts and figures by painting the naval air station as a place of death-defying competition, camaraderie, romanticism, and 1950s post-war nostalgia. The author's incredibly vivid imagery strapped readers into the cockpit of a fighter jet long before the days of GoPro cameras and smartphones. In fact, a Hood Yonais colorful telling of the Navy training program was so exhilarating and cinematic that it compelled Paramount to immediately seek him out and secure the exclusive rights to his story for film production as we saw. The resulting 1986 film produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and its screenplay written by Jim Cash and Jack Epps Jr. was derived from the story. Indeed, the 1986 film specifically credits Ehud Yonais for his story. It is also well accepted that Top Gun was based on the story. It naturally follows that the 2022 sequel to the 1986 film, again produced by Bruckheimer, and on which Cash and Epps again received writing credits, is derived from a Hood Yonais story. In case it's not obvious, if the 2022 sequel movie is not a derivative work, 
of the 1986 film or the 1983 story, then Paramount can do whatever it wants. There's no copyright problem. A review of the 2022 sequel, like the 1986 film, reveals key elements that are substantially similar to those in the story as set forth in Exhibit 1 to this complaint and incorporated by reference herein. Uh, spoiler alert, I guess. If you haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, but I'm going to read it anyway. Here's Exhibit 1. And then they have a chart of similarities. There's 19 pages of similarities. Basically, there's two characters. They are jocular, up-and-coming lieutenants trying to make names for themselves. I never knew that Maverick's name was Pete or that Goose's name was Nick. Nope, never knew that. Uh, so yes, some of the names are different, but it seems like a lot of the elements are the same. So they're going to make the case that there's a lot of similar elements. I will post this exhibit down below in the description. Uh, it'll be on Patreon, but there will be no paywall. There's never any paywall for the documents. Rather than taking an hour to go through all of these uh, individual similarities. Despite the 2022 sequel clearly having derived from the story, Paramount consciously failed to secure a new license of film and ancillary rights in the story following the Onay's recovery of their U.S. copyright on January 24th, 2020. Plaintiffs alleged that the 2022 sequel was not completed until May 8th, 2021, more than one year after Paramount's grant had been statutorily terminated. The 2022 sequel, therefore, unlike the 1986 film, does not qualify for the prior derivative works exception under 203b1 like we read before, and thus infringes the copyright owned by the Yonez. Without a newly secured license, Paramount's exploitation of the sequel in the United States constitutes ongoing intentional infringement of the Yonez copyright, including their exclusive right to prepare derivative works, which Paramount had owned pursuant to the grant but lost on January 24th, 2020, and willfully proceeded to exploit nonetheless. Paramount was placed on notice when they served the notice of termination. We got that. On May 11th, 2022, the Yonez sent Paramount a cease and desist letter regarding the 2022 sequel. On May 13th, Paramount responded in total denial of the fact that its sequel was obviously derivative of the story. Paramount additionally argued that the sequel was sufficiently completed by January 24th, 2020, the effective termination date, in a disingenuous attempt to bootstrap the sequel into the prior derivative works exception to termination. As a direct and proximate result of Paramount's actions, the Yonez will suffer imminent and irreparable harm, and so they're also asking for an injunction. So count one is for declaratory relief. They're going to ask the court to declare that Paramount has infringed on their copyright, that their termination was good and all that. Count two is then for infringement of the story's copyright, and then count three would be for injunctive relief. I'm not sure what injunctive relief they're saying there's no adequate remedy at law, which is the way you get injunctive relief, but what inadequate, I don't understand. It's money. They're not going to get paid money. That's an adequate remedy at law. That means they can get a court to give them money and Paramount will have to pay the money. And if Paramount can't pay the money, then Paramount could be forced into bankruptcy, which isn't going to happen because Paramount has the money. So I'm not sure why they're asking for injunctive relief. It, maybe it's just a tactic. If you're, if you're going to tell a movie studio, we're going to get your film yanked from the theaters, maybe they'll be more pliable in negotiations. So yeah, that's really interesting. We don't see that very often. I think we saw a termination of copyright transfer in the Winnie the Pooh case. There's been a bunch of them, but they often don't make headlines unless it's for a big property like this one. So I think that's very interesting. We'll follow this one. I'll follow up on what Paramount has to say. A summons was issued to Paramount, but I don't have the date that they're supposed to respond by. So it should be soon. And they'll probably respond with a motion to dismiss saying that this is not a derivative work. And it'll probably take a while for this one to wind its way through the court system unless the parties can come to an agreement. Let me know what you think of this situation and the overall policy of copyright termination in the comments below. 
Thanks for watching! Special thanks to my top supporters in June. John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hytov, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Good Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, and King Ares. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.